as our scripture reading today comes from the book of John. I'll be reading chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. Uh, John 1, 43 through 51. Today I am in the NIV translation. The next day Jesus decided to leave Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching him, he said, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me, Nathaniel asked, and Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus said, You believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending <coughs> on the Son of Man. The Word of God for the people of God. As we look at today's scripture, we're reminded of a time when faith and church were the center of the community. Virtually all members of the Jewish community would have been people of faith. <coughs> If some chose not to be a part of that community of faith, well, they were essentially not going to be a part of the community. That's the way it was. All life in Jerusalem centered around the temple, and in the other areas centered around the local synagogues. We sadly realize that that's a far cry from the world that we live in today. These Jewish communities had long awaited for a prophet. And so it was big time news when these people of faith heard that John the Baptist had begun his ministry in the desert. The faithful go out in large numbers to hear the message of this new prophet. And he tells them that God has answered their prayers and that a Messiah is coming and would soon appear. And that they needed to repent, to make a straight path for the Lord to follow. So following the accounts in the Gospel of John, after Jesus' baptism, he comes back to the river, and John the Baptist tells a couple of his followers, look, here is the Lamb of God. And those two leave John, and they follow Jesus. One we know is Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Andrew went and brought Simon to Jesus, and Jesus said, you are Simon. Son of John, you are to be called Cephas, which in our language is Peter. And that is the point where our scripture picks up this morning. Jesus has walked to Galilee and he calls Philip and he simply says, follow me. And the very first thing that Philip does is he goes and he seeks out his friend in the family. He tells him the good news that the Messiah has come. He says, we have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. He is Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Like I said, these Jews have waited for centuries for the coming of the Messiah. There had been false prophets and false messiahs before. As we discussed during Advent this year, Nazareth was considered kind of a, a, a lot like a low-class community, a community of laborers, maybe even a few ruffians. Its main claim to fame was that it had a freshwater spring. So Nathaniel's response to Philip, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? And Philip simply says, come and see. You see, Philip's, you can, you can almost feel Philip's excitement. He doesn't get into a debate. He just says, come and see. Come and see for yourself what I've seen. 
Nathaniel can see that his friend is genuine. And obviously, if the Messiah has come, a person of faith would certainly want to go and see him. So whatever Nathaniel was doing, he put, a, put it aside and he put aside whatever doubts that he had. And he followed Philip. Today, what we're going to look at is the process of Nathaniel's conversion. The process. It's very similar to how Paul was converted on the road to Damascus. And it's very similar to how a lot of conversions happen today. Nathaniel is already a man of faith. We know this from Jesus' description of him. So the first part of his conversion is that he hears the good news. He hears the good news. Philip told him we have found the one that Moses wrote about and that the prophets told us about. And Nathaniel hears the excitement in the voice of his friend Philip. He hears the joyful words of a faithful Jew who has met Jesus and was satisfied that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. It's a message of good news. Philip is just bursting to share, so he goes to his good friends. It's bursting out of him. And if you've ever seen a newly converted believer, that's so often the case. They just are so excited that they just can't wait to go and tell somebody. The next part of Nathaniel's conversion is that he hears the good news. He questions he hears it, and now he questions it. Naturally, such an amazing event has to be questioned and tested. Nazareth was insignificant, perhaps even infamous from some of our readings. How could the greatest of all the prophets, how could the Messiah come from such an unlikely place? Now, yes, the true Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But he was raised in Nazareth. And Nathaniel simply says, can anything good come from Nazareth? And like I said, Philip didn't debate him. He just said, come and see. So he comes, and the next step in Nathaniel's conversion is that he has to have proof before him. The scripture reads that when Jesus saw Nathanael approach him, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. That sounds like a very honorable, praising description of somebody, especially coming from Jesus. Nathanael's no doubt taken aback by these words. He's also probably a little confused because his next question is, how do you know me? See, Jesus sees a true seeker standing before him. An Israelite in whom there's no deceit, and Jesus immediately makes himself known to Nathaniel. He replies, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And at that point, it is likely that Nathaniel had the realization that this good thing didn't really come from Nazareth. This good thing came from heaven above. He accepted Philip's challenge to come and see, and very quickly, Nathaniel goes from seeker to believer. And so the next thing in his conversion is that he has to believe. He has to believe the words of Jesus. It's apparent from the dialogue that he does. I like one of the comments in one of my commentaries written by Reverend James Smith. He wrote, The inference is clear that he did believe, but what else could he do? The evidence of his Messiahship had been overwhelmingly convicted, convicting as the demonstration made had been entirely within himself, entirely within the van. Christ's divinity was proven by his operating upon Nathaniel's own heart and conscience, not by any outward display of a miracle. 
Moral miracles are the monuments which still attest to Jesus' divine power and Godhead. And Reverend Smith went on to say the best way to prove the divinity and the saving power of Jesus Christ is simply to submit yourself to him. Then you will get a witness within you that cannot be silenced. So Philip sowed a seed to his friend Nathaniel, and that seed fell not only on good land, but on an honest heart, and it couldn't help but bear fruit. And so the next process in Nathaniel's conversion is a confession of faith. In verse 49, Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. So Nathaniel believes in his heart, and he declares his belief with his mouth. And there is no fear in his confession. There's no doubt in his confession. He is saying that you are the one that we have waited so long for. Nathaniel realized that Jesus is the Savior, and that he should fully submit himself. Jesus. We discussed last Sunday how the cause of persecution, and this is a few years after the events we're reading today, but how the cause of persecution, many were likely afraid to openly confess their belief. Many were martyred. But let's not forget that Jesus would soon teach these words. Those who confess me before men I will confess before my Father in heaven. Powerful words. Words of truth. And so the final step in Nathaniel's conversion is that he receives encouragement. That's an important step that sometimes in the modern world we forget. We don't follow up. We don't continue the dialogues. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. Man, you're going to see a lot more than that. Paraphrasing, of course. You're going to see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. There's always an open heaven and a blessed hereafter for those who confess in Jesus. It is a glorious and a soul-satisfying vision to see an open heaven and the messengers of God ascending and descending. There is no other communication between this cursed earth and heaven except through Jesus. Be taught I am the way. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He is our mediator before the Father. Only those who delight to fulfill his purposes, his will, can ascend and descend upon this holy way that this vision is describing. Hopefully this vision encourages and strengthens us as we go about the daily tasks of doing the work for Christ to which we've been called. And so remembering that Nathaniel was already basically pure of heart. Jesus said he held no deceit. I'd like to share a with a closing story I've been holding for the right day to share. It's called The Glory of a Stainless Life. An Arabian princess was once presented by her teacher with a casket. Now, the first thing I had to do was stop and look up what a casket was. Okay? It's an ivory ornamental box. It's very fancy. It's usually got satin inside of it, and it's got a lock and a key. You put treasured items in it. So an Arabian princess was presented by her teacher with an ivory ornament box, not to be opened until one year had passed from the time she was given the gift. And so the princess impatiently waits, and finally the day comes, and with trembling hands she unlocks the treasure. And behold, on the satin lining on the inside, lay a shroud of rust. The form of something that had once been beautiful, but all the beauty was gone. And there was a slip of parchment within that contained these words. 
Dear pupil, learn a lesson in your life. This trinket, when enclosed, had upon it only a tiny spot of rust. But by neglect, it has become the useless thing that you now behold. Only a blot on its pure surroundings. So a little stain on your character will, by inattention and neglect, mar a bright and useful life. And in time, leave only the dark shadow of what might have been. Place here in a jewel of gold, and after many years, you will find it still as sparkling as ever. And so within yourself, treasure up only the pure, the good, and you will be an ornament to society and a source of true pleasure to yourself and to your friends. My friends, I simply close today praying that we can be found like Nathaniel with no deceit and that we can learn the lesson given to this princess to be a treasure to all of those that we encounter. My friends, may the light of Christ flow through you into the hearts of those that are in dark places as you encounter them. I pray this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.